ChatGPT has exploded in popularity in the last few months. So last week I decided to give it a go and find out how I could use this tool to improve my productivity as a business intelligence developer. Hi, this is Jason from Effective Dashboards, helping maintenance and reliability professionals get the most out of Power BI. So welcome back to another video. So we're going to look at three different scenarios that I was faced with last week and explain how I used ChatGPT to assist in those different scenarios. So the first one we're going to look at is writing some code in DAX. Now it's going to be pretty simple and pretty straightforward code, but I'm going to just talk you through the process for that. The second is looking at code and adding some comments to the code to explain exactly what it does. The third is to do a little bit of research and a bit of exploration as to some KPIs and measures that I could use in a new BI tool that I was about to create. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at is creating some DAX code and using GPT, chart GPT to actually generate the code for this. Now, the code that I want to generate is going to be a text string. So it's going to be a measure that's going to output a text string that's going to be used underneath this value here. And I want it to, I've got a target, I've already got a measure for the target. I've already got the, the obviously the, the current value there. And I want to just create a simple string that tells us the target and then in brackets, the variance between the current value and the target. So let's over, head over and we will start to create a prompt in chat GPT. Okay, so chat GPT, it's created by a company called openai.com and I'm assuming that you know this if you've searched for this video. If you don't, then you need to go and visit this URL here at the top of the page and create yourself an account. I'm not going to talk you through that because it's fairly straightforward. Um, there's two options. There's a, a free option at the moment which can sometimes be at capacity, so you need to wait a while to be able to use it, or you can pay a, a sum and you can get um, access to the, the plus version, which I've got here, and that allows you guaranteed access to the the, the prompts and to the, the actual tool, the chatbot tool. So it's essentially a chatbot. You type in a prompt here and it gives you a response. So I'm gonna ask it to create um, a piece of code. Okay, so here's the prompt here. The first thing I've done is I've, I've told it the situation I'm, I'm in just now. So I have two DAX measures. The first is the actual value. The second is the target value. Please create a third measure. This measure should return a text string that displays the target value and then the difference between the actual value and the target value. The difference should be in brackets. Okay, so pretty natural and pretty conversational. Now, one of the things I have understood through working with ChatGPT is that you do need to use it as a tool and understand how to actually write these prompts. Okay, so let's see what this comes back with. Okay, so it's created this code here. So target versus actual, and then we've got available for the target value, available for the actual value, and then we've got the difference, and then it's basically concatenated those together. So we've got the target value, is the target value, and then that's concatenated with the difference. Great, it's exactly what we're looking for. Now, I've used these placeholders, target value and actual value, and I have found that if you put the actual measure name in right at the start, it can get a little bit confused if the measure has got some words in it that could be misconstrued. It's not pretty good, but you know, keep it straightforward like this. So what I actually want to do now is, before I copy it across into Power BI, I want it to go and rename the, the measures and the actual measure name itself. Okay, so I've asked it to rename it. It's a fairly convoluted name, but we've got it in there. In fact, I've got that the wrong way around. Let me just change that. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is I want to actually show if it's a positive value, I want a, I want the, the positive value to be prefixed with a plus, and if it's a negative value with a, a negative. So let's ask it to do that. Okay, can you please prefix the output to display a plus or a minus? Okay, so that's now going to prefix if it's a positive value with a plus and if it's a negative value with a negative or, or a minus. So the next thing I need to do is these target values here, these measures here are, are not these ones here. So let's replace those. Okay, so I hasn't quite understood that. So let's ask it a slightly different way. Now, this is what you understand. that You need to actually work with the tool. So, okay, so I've asked it to replace that and I'll do the same for the actual value. Okay, so let's now copy and paste this back into our measure here. Okay, so we can see too many arguments were passed to concatenate. Now, I did notice that, that concatenate takes two arguments here. So we're going to go back and we're going to ask it to, what we're going to do is we're going to go in here, and I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to go back into here. Okay. 
Okay, now it's told us it's replace concatenate with the correct function, which is concatenate x. Now, it hasn't done that, okay? So let's go and try and regenerate this response again. Okay, so it's kind of stuck in a little bit of a, a loop there. So the other thing I can ask it to do is, can you write a diff can you use a different approach to this code? Right, so great. Now it's done is use this these here. Okay, so it didn't get quite get it the first time, but it's done it now. So let's go and copy that and we'll see how it gets on. Okay, so it seems to be a bit better there. And let's go and we're gonna add that into here. Now I've got a button here. So I'm just add it in as a text. Now the reason I use a button is because you've got quite a bit of format in here to format the text to the left, to the light, to the center, um, put a bit of a padding around it or whatever. So it's a bit more flexible than using a, a card for text. Right, and I'm gonna type in GPT, because that was in the title. And we'll add that in here. Okay, so here we can see we've got the target value is a thousand and the, the plus has been added on to the starter here, but it's still not quite right. So let's go in and I want that to be two decimal places and I want some commas to be on here. Okay, so it's added in this format statement here and we've got this format here, which I always get confused about when, when to use a hash and a zero, and I always need to kind of look it up and whatever, so I just save a little bit of time there. And um, it's to zero decimal places, and we can see that it's got the comma there for the thousands. So let's copy that back in. Okay, so here we have it, we've got the code there, the target value is a thousand, and we've got that's plus 46 above above there, and we can put some conditional format, etc. So. It does get there in the end, you just got to use it as a tool, understand the prompts that you got to put in. You probably do need a little bit of an understanding of DAX. It did get a little bit confused and then a bit of a, a loop with the concatenate and the concatenate X side of things. But if it does get into that, then a good approach is just to ask it to use a different approach. And that seemed to work and it just used the ampersands to concatenate the string together. So it's a pretty straightforward piece of DAX there. It was nothing too complicated about that. You could argue you could probably just write it yourself. Um, but I think when it comes to a bit more complicated DAX, first of all, you do need to have a bit of an understanding. And um, and second, it might accelerate that process a bit more. I'm gonna create another video on that another time. Okay, so the second thing I am going to use it for is to explain and add some comments to some code that's already in a measure. So I'm gonna go and I've already copied that code and I've done a, a few different prompts here and the one that seems to work is if you type in rewrite okay okay so rewrite the following code adding comments and if you hold down shift and press return and then i'm going to paste the code in here okay so it's a fairly straightforward piece of code here that's going to go and apply some conditional format and basically to the top three highest um, values so let's see what it comes back with when i enter this Okay, so we can see what's happened. It's actually dissected the code and, and put some an explanation in the chat GPT um, tool as to what the code does, which is great. And you can read through that and you can understand exactly what it's doing. But I wanted to actually embed the comments within the code. So I'm gonna ask it to rewrite again. Okay, so now it's off. It's rewriting the code in here. So again, just understanding how to use the prompts is important. And the other thing I want to do is, is put the code at the top here. So I'm going to actually ask it to insert the first line of comments after the, the measured name. Okay, so I wanted that to be before the measure name. Otherwise, it gets confused and thinks the name of the measure is the actual totality of the code and the actual measure name when you put when you paste it back into Power BI. So that's great. It's actually added some other some codes here. Now the other thing I want to do is we've got some quite long lines here so I'm going to ask it to rewrite. Okay so if it's if the comments above 50 take a new line so that it's um, it's easier to read. And we can see it's starting to add in new lines here. So it just makes it a little bit neater. Now the other thing you can do finally is you can actually add it, you can actually get make the code more descriptive in the style of. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say Okay, so rewrite the comments so that someone learning DAX can understand it clearly. Okay, I'm going to expand it a little bit more and I'm going to ask it to, in the comments, explain more about the functions that are used. 
Okay, so that's going to add in a little bit more of a, a kind of rich commentary to the actual um, formula, which is useful if it's somebody that's uh, perhaps isn't used to using ducks or is somebody that's an occasional user so they can come back in here and they can understand exactly what's happening. So the proof of the pudding is whether this actually works. So let's copy this code here and I'm going to go across and I'm going to paste it into here. Okay, this is the code that's got a little bit of comments in here, but not too much. So I'm just going to paste that in here and see if that all gets accepted. Okay, so we can see we've got nicely commented code here. A good explanation for somebody that might be a bit new to DAX coming in and actually looking at this code and trying to dissect what it actually does. So obviously this could be scaled up to bigger, more complicated measures, uh, but the, the principle is exactly the same. So the third use case is going to be brainstorming. Okay, so this is, if you've got some domain knowledge, then great. You can still use it just to kind of brainstorm what you already know. But if you're perhaps a business intelligence developer who's you know, got domain knowledge and maybe finance, but you want to um, go and create a dashboard that's related to perhaps reliability or maintenance, that's my domain knowledge, then you can go and actually explore some KPIs and some measures and also the definition of those that might be something you can discuss with the person that's going to use the dashboard. So I'm going to go and look for measures related to a root cause analysis um, visualization tool. Okay, please suggest 10 KPIs or measures related to performance management of a root cause failure analysis process. Okay, so really quickly, it's given us these ones here. Number of incident investigated, uh, time to complete an investigation, root cause identification accuracy, time to implement corrective actions, which is good. So we can see here, we've got a load of um, measures or KPIs that we might want to start exploding. So let's go and ask it to expand on some of these and put together um, a definition of how may, we might want to calculate some of these. Okay, so I've just taken one of them and I'm going to say how would we calculate the effectiveness of corrective actions. Okay, so it's asking us here, it's, it's actually telling us further measures that we could use to measure the, um, the effectiveness of corrective actions, which, you know, which is pretty good. Okay, so you can actually ask it, well, how would you measure the incident reoccurrence rate? Okay, so it's starting to give us a detailed measure here. So incident reoccurrence rate is the number of incidents or corrective actions divided by the total number of incidents times 100. And it's giving you some examples here. So very quickly, you're getting down into the nitty gritty of how you actually could construct some measures or some KPIs that you could then understand, right, do we have the data that's available for this? And that's maybe the next question to ask for. Okay, so it's came back and said we need to have the following data. If we want to, if we want to calculate the... Um, incident reoccurrence rate, we need to calculate the total number of incidents, we need to calculate the date of each one, description, the status, the date of when the corrective actions were implemented, and the description of the corrective act um, actions. And it's basically telling you, once you've collected this data, you can you can use it to calculate the incident reoccurrence rate by identifying incidents that occurred after implementing the corrective actions. And that's why you need the date. And dividing the total number of incidents this will help you track the effectiveness of your corrective actions and make improvements as necessary. So, again, if you've got domain knowledge, it can actually help you to just generate some new ideas. If you don't have as much domain knowledge, then it can actually help you to get some ideas together for when you go and discuss this with a client or with a, a customer that's going to use the, the BI tool. So that's the, the third use case here, is carrying out some research, really quick, really pointed. All this information is probably going to be available on Google, but it's a far more conversational and you can interact with this, you can ask questions, you can pursue avenues of investigation. And one of the big bonus points is you don't have any of the distractions that come when you're surfing the web. You've got adverts, you've got clickbait for clicking on various other links and there's all sorts of other things that can distract you. You're getting straight to the point here and you're getting really pointed answers. So for the first video, chat GPT, three use cases that you might consider in your role as a business intelligence developer. There's far more, and I will create other videos on this, and in particular when we're writing some docs, going to that in a bit, more a bit more depth. So hopefully you found something useful here. If you did, it's always much appreciated and really helpful if you could give the video a thumbs up and a like. And if you want to keep up to date with the latest videos, then hit the subscribe button and you'll get a notification whenever I publish a new video. Thanks again for watching, and I'll talk to you in the next video.